the story starts really, you know, at least as far as I'm concerned, 1991 when local school councils uh, began. Mm -hmm. And uh, at that time, uh, we moved my son from a uh, magnet school to this, our local school, so that he could make friends in his own neighborhood and not have to take that awful bus trip. And, and uh, uh, so we brought him over here, and at that time, there was, it was asphalt from, as you recall, from, from one end of the uh, block to the other. It was just completely nothing. It was completely a dead space. Uh, except for these four gigantic bur oak trees. And these trees were kind of a little signal to us. Or, uh, they're old trees. They're old, old trees. And these are not only just old trees, they're the signature trees of this uh, Midwest area, you know, the Midwest mm -hmm. ecology. Uh, oak savannas and oak woodlands are part of, you know, what are really, really special globally uh, imperiled ecosystems. And so to have these four gigantic trees, which arborists tell us are between two and 300 years old, it's just so incredible, incredibly lucky, you know, for one thing. Sure. And uh, I remember in that first local school council, they said, we got to do something about the, about the asphalt desert. We have to do something, but we didn't know what to do and we didn't have any money. Uh, so it took uh, several years, but eventually we started by planting tiny little gardens around the base of the oak trees that consisted of all the old, plants that used to be there so in its community. So we felt good to have restored the kind of plant community around the base of the trees that used to be there. Every year, you know, we had no soils. That's one incredible thing. We had no soil in the whole place and we had no money. So we had to go very slow with our planting because uh, it costs money to buy soils. It costs quite a bit and, uh, and we didn't have any. And so the first little places we, we made were quite small. And then after that, every year, we would add another little area, just a little scallop of new plantings. And instead of buying the plants, then we started to collect the seed and, and uh, grow our own native plants. Uh, so that every year, the, the uh, native gardens grew and grew. Until now, they, they kind of circle the entire, um, this section of the garden. And there's lots of. Even the, the shrubbery is all kind of native shrubs that you would find, you won't find if you walk the neighborhoods at all. They're all pretty rare stuff. This is nine bark, and this is, I forget, forget the name of it. Yeah, no, it'll come back to me. It's that uh, beautiful smelling leaf it has. Anyway, uh, this was a little wetland area over here. So lots of native plants we have going in, and they're absolutely beautiful and endless. Um, endless subject for kids to study about um, form and, and uh, seeds and flowers, all those things. And, and you know, once you restore these kind of plants, uh, birds and um, insects mm -hmm. come back that need them, that never, that hadn't had them before, you know, yeah. little, these little chickadees and uh, goldfinches coming through. So you started working with kids in the garden in like the mid-90s, is that right? Uh, yeah, that's right, maybe 1994. Our first thing that we did was that we got a, a, a partnership with the Nature Conservancy and started taking our kids out to the forest preserves. So third, fourth, and fifth all went to the forest preserves to study native ecosystems. And that was a blessing for us because they paid for our buses. We didn't have any money for buses. And they've been paying for all these years now our buses to take the kids there. And so the kids get this three-year-long experience of studying native places in, in intact, wild places. And uh, then, you know, they bring some of that knowledge back to here and where we, can, where we have the stuff right at hand. Uh, and uh, we, we kind of capped those three years with uh, river studies at second grade and at sixth grade so that they were getting then five years of ecology without any ecology director. It was just kind of hit or miss, you know, how, how we did it. So. Um, Anyway, at some point, the teachers were asking if we couldn't have a, quote, regular garden, too, a garden that had a, a, where they could grow vegetables and, and, and annual plants, the flowers that they recognized. And so we built these uh, with the help of Green Corps. We built these 20 boxes, and at the time, we allotted them to each classroom. And in the spring, we would go and, uh, and plant them up. I would buy some flats of flowers and vegetables and let the kids, uh, you know, choose what they wanted to plant. I had a sign-up sheet in the in the office, and teachers would pick a time to be with me out here, and we would always organize it into like smaller groups so that I didn't have 25 kids trying to plant at the same time, but maybe eight kids at a time seemed more reasonable. And the other kids would do some other activities, kind of, so they'd rotate through these activities. Uh, and uh, 
and that worked pretty good. The problem was that, like for many schools, during summer break, uh, during summer break, there was nobody to tend the garden, and so they would be usually just kind of go bad, you know, die off and stuff. And so the kids would come back in this fall and see just not much, you know. Right. And so um, we were trying to figure out what to do, and we would notice that a lot of um, neighbors were coming in and asking if this was a community garden, and we said, not really, it's a school garden. But we started to think that maybe we should have a community garden. So some years after that, we opened this whole side, which was gravel and asphalt, and uh, and said, this is a community garden. We laid out some kind of funny looking paths and uh, plots and told the people, you know, bring some soil and, and start. And in exchange for having this little bit of land, every Wednesday night we would work here and they would maintain the gardens, mm -hmm. the whole gardens, not just their own. They'd work on their own and then help work. And so over these past, you know, 15 or 20 years, we've got a lot of gardeners and a lot of helpers. Most of them don't have plots. Most of them just come for the fun of being here and uh, finding friends and all that business. And there's a wait list for the plots now? It's not even a wait list. It's like a, it's based on merit or something. You know, if you come, if you're always here on Wednesday nights and a plot becomes open, you got the plot. You can't just put your name on a list, you know, because it doesn't show really that you got what it takes. We learned early on that you could uh, get free wood chips from the city, and so we had lots of wood chips pu put down. And after a few years, the chips um, break down and, and form kind of a little rudimentary soil, which was important for us because we had no soil, you know. So if you um, if you add some fertilizer or compost to this, it's, it works actually pretty good as a soil. And, and so we're, we mine this routinely to get new soils for our gardens and then bring more chips in and let them rot again. And I noticed you have compost bins and they talked about that on the tour as well. Yeah, the compost yeah. compost bins, you know, started out as just heaps and then we put a little frame around it and then uh, the city uh, established a code for composting and so uh, our, all our bins are now to, to the city code. So they're wrapped all the way on the bottom and the top and everything so that uh, mice and rats couldn't get in if they wanted to. and. Uh, it really works great. So maybe four years ago, we started composting lunchroom waste, and uh, we we're a little nervous at first to see whether we would be able to do it like all through winter, but mm -hmm. no problem at all. The bins stay hot all through winter, so 130 degrees inside, even when it's like 30 degrees outside. So it's pretty impressive. And, and they, the kids learn how to how the composting works and bring yeah. it into the Yeah, they do everything. They, so the kids bring it out every day. They chop it up and they throw it in there, cover it over with some carbon source, either straw or, or leaves. Usually I'm the one who monitors to make sure that it's, that it's active and working well. And, uh, um, and they, you know, when the bin is full, we seal it off and it rests for several months in order to break down everything. And when it's finished, we open it up and the kids take it out and sift it and, and, and put it on the beds. This is all sifted compost, mm -hmm. you know. And so it's ready to replenish it. Uh, and then they, of course, plant the gardens, and then they harvest the gardens, and they eat the food. So it's great. This year was, I think, we had just way more than ever before. And so every class that came out in the fall uh, was able to have like a big feast of, of raw vegetables on their way in, which they devour mm -hmm. with gusto. And so now you're probably working on putting the garden to bed. Yeah, we are, and uh, and yet because we have the cold frames, we're also planting. We're still planting stuff. We just, you know, planting lettuces. You can see in those, you know, baby lettuce that mm -hmm. I think will will make it into December, especially if it's not if we don't get some terrible, terrible frost. So that's pretty cool. And then we can we start planting again early, like in February. You know? So end of February, we can start planting. So clear all the ice out. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, with the tops on, it clears itself. It you know thaws really quick. I gotta tell you the, another thing I, I just love about this. In the whole hundred years that the school was here, these oak trees never had any young, you know, because there was simply no place for anything to grow on these school grounds. But once the garden started, you know, all these are young oak trees planted mostly by uh, squirrels. And every year there's a new cohort of trees and we, we export them and give them away to people who, who would like to have, you know, old lineage oak trees. And uh, it's very, it's really quite wonderful. This is a, a really um, a fun area because, you know, it's used for everything. Like at garden night, we always end the garden night with a fire and some food and sometimes music. And uh, also, you know, classrooms can come out here. You can do drama out here or music or uh, re quiet reading. Any, you know, it's just a really nice sitting place. Um, 
and the logs were free. You know, we tried to use everything recyclable and not, not buy things for anything we didn't have money. But the other thing is it just seemed to make sense to use big fences and use logs and stuff like this. So it's a lovely, lovely place where the kids can can do so many activities. And we've had weddings here and we birthday parties and mm -hmm. Boy Scout and Girl Scouts come over here. So I should come over here and read. <laughs> oh, for sure. Lots of people do yoga. You guys do Tai Chi for a long time here. And it's really quite beautiful. We did, uh, when we were doing this, starting uh, taking out asphalt, we did stuff with the kids, at calculating the amount of water that was retained on site as opposed to going into the sewers and, and surcharging sewers and uh, polluting the river. And so we, we kept a, a, like a little meter showing how every year, you know, we were capturing more and more water, you know, maybe already a one and a half million gallons of water a year was kept on site. Uh, and so after this project is done, it's now like something like four million gallons are, are kept on site instead of going into the river. So the houses on that side of the street, for example, never get flooded anymore because there's so much capacity in the sewer since no more water is coming from uh, Waters Elementary. All under here, it's got gigantic storage capacity in, in uh, graded uh, limestone that they put underneath. And we have two 500-gallon cisterns on the top of this roof. It's got a green roof on it, mm -hmm. too. It's got a planted roof. It's got a hot water, solar hot water. And we have one uh, 1.2 kV uh, solar collector, electrical collector there up there. So it's got a lot of really nice features in it. I mean, one nice thing is it's got a south facing window that it's at the right angle so that it uh, sun doesn't really come in during the summer but during the winter it's flooded with light and it's, it's quite be quite nice. beautiful yeah nice. anyway so now we have a gigantic gigantic school gardens you know and we're growing more food than ever and uh, and the kids are helping out and we're, and we're trying to figure out how to how to farm because we have lots of lots of room to do it next week for example we're doing a big uh, we're cooking up jams from berries that we picked this summer so we had about 80 pounds of currants and uh, gooseberries and we'll be having kids help us to prepare these jams at the church across the street and uh, you know we just had our big potato fest last week so kids come out and we had fires and we burnt you know cooked up potatoes and that we had grown and harvested so it's fun it's a really awesome thing thank you so much you're so welcome Taking us around.